A very warm welcome to everyone. I'm Shanti, and with me today are some notable deep dive experts from across industries. Um, so deep tech, as you all know, is no longer in the proof of concept stage in India. It is very much a part of our everyday lives. Every business is leveraging uh, multiple technologies like machine learning, artificial intelligence, so on and so forth. And uh, many macro conditions have also come in as a blessing in disguise for this particular segment. For instance, the pandemic, it has not only accelerated uh, the adoption of tech among masses and businesses, it has also led to uh, increased awareness uh, about sustainability. And this has led to many more uh, use cases of deep tech uh, across uh, industries like EV and climate tech. So without much delay, I would like to get into my first question to all of you. So um, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, Deep Tech has many use cases across segments. What, according to you, is the biggest use case that your company offers? And also, what is the biggest change that it has brought to the sector you are in? If you can just introduce yourself briefly and take it up. Yeah, we can start from left. Uh, first of all, thanks, Shanti, uh, for this question. Uh, just wanted to introduce uh, our company. We, we are disrupting the orthodox staff augmentation and remote software development industry. So we are a tech company at heart, and that's why we are uh, involved with deep tech heavily and invested uh, many things that are involved with deep tech, AI, ML, etc. Uh, essentially, we have our internal proprietary tools and software algorithms to match uh, appropriate talent uh, for, uh, talent that, uh, that are mostly the engineers from our vetted talent bank to the, uh, to the companies and different projects. So essentially, we are doing it through uh, text analytics, skill and project mapping of the engineers that we have in our talent bank. Uh, and this is uh, like, uh, as we know, remote software development and uh, outsourcing per se is one of the biggest revenue source of India as well as for many big tech giants like Wipro, Infosys, etc. So uh, as a company, we, we, we are using uh, deep tech per se to give a use case. For example, if we have a project for a healthcare domain, then our algorithm is matching a software developer uh, who has actually worked with healthcare domain and can assimilate with the right atmosphere of a healthcare domain. In the sense, we are actually uh, solving a critical problem of talent shortage A, and we are saving uh, at least $2,000 per hire for, for the companies. And we are giving an experience of ramping up and ramping down of the engineering teams uh, at an instantaneous level. So that is one thing. The second part of the question uh, is that like what, what new things and what all uh, uh, new updates that we would get into deep tech as the industry evolves. Uh, I see, for example, if I'm taking about ChatGPT uh, Chat only, and we were all discussing about ChatGPT before this uh, panel, like, I, according to me, the new uh, tech that we are, uh, we are having at this particular stage uh, would, uh, would build new roles. And also, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, cancel the roles which were uh, mundane uh, at past. So for example, uh, accounting per se would be a mundane role which can get distorted eventually. So that's uh, my take on this. Thanks, Shanti. Uh, I'm Sunil. Uh, I head tech for Shiprocket. So essentially what we do, if we, we all know how e-commerce industry functions. So there are two halves to it. One is through marketplaces and other is through D2C brands. So essentially uh, we give the fulfillment services to D2C brands and small businesses in, in a nutshell. So for me, if we talk about deep tech, it goes anything which goes much beyond your traditional if then else as a statements and helps you to give the wow factor to the customer. So we heard about Zipto currently, if the promise is 10 minutes and if you get the stuff in eight minutes, so that's sort of a wow factor. So especially in our industry, so we do deliveries with uh, our third party courier partners. 
So likes of delivery, easy com express and all. So imagine you are running a business and you have a courier recommendation engine at your disposal, which is trained over uh, huge volumes of data and is able to give you the best recommended courier which suits your pricing, which suits your SLAs, which suits your demands. That is a perfect use case what we uh, provide to our customers. Another thing can be uh, what we essentially do. You are running a business and a portion, significant portion of your orders is say on cash on delivery. So if a cash on delivery order is returned, a RTO happens. So as a business owner, it's a double whammy for you because you are paying the freight from both the sites and it's a locked in inventory for you and you are not making money on it. So we have solutions where we give a lever to you where uh, you incentivize your customers to change to that COD uh, order into a prepaid order. So things like those, where, which are enhancing factors for your business and also serve as a wow factor for your customers. Thanks Shanti, I'm Shashank and I work as a Chief Development Architect for SAP Labs, uh, Bangalore. So from uh, my side, all I can say, we work on two aspects of uh, deep tech or AI. One aspect is that the verticals can use AI in an embedded fashion, which means, uh, let's say, a supply chain domain. So they have very specific needs for AI, and which might be different from a CRM kind of a scenario. So what we do is we provide some kind of a platform where they can embed the AI into their specific verticals. Like as an example, I work for a team for API management. Now currently what we are doing is we are looking for a solution to do anomaly detection on top of the APIs we have. So how do we approach it? We take the platform provided by another team, which is providing all the workflows which we need for building an AI solution on top. So we use that to build our own embedded AI solution. Going forward, what we see, and particularly I see how SAP will proceed, is there are talks of, let's say, having their own language model deployed in our data centers. Primarily the reason being that chat GPT, there are a lot of privacy concerns. Can I share my private data of a customer with chat GPT? Definitely a no, right? So we need to run these kind of models within our own data centers, within our own premises, and where we can serve the customers in a secured way. So that would be the idea from the SAP side. Hi, uh, my name is Sumit Sabarwal and I lead a company known as Teamly's HR Tech. Uh, what we do exactly, being a 20 years old company, what we're doing is we're transforming the employee experience by leveraging deep tech, uh, primarily AI, machine learning, and also a lot of new technologies that as we speak are evolving around the globe. Uh, we manage close to about 2 million employees on our platform as on date, focused on India. And some of the very breakthrough uh, products across our product stack uh, are zero touch applicant tracking systems and one touch uh, HCM platforms. Uh, coupled very, very uniquely with uh, edutech platforms, with uh, regulatory tech platforms, that gives us seamless experience. Um, a lot of exciting things that we're doing, we're having our innovation center here uh, in Bangalore and uh, uh, happy to be here on this planet, Shanti, thanks. Yeah, hi, I'm Sharmin, and I'm the founder and CEO at InStoried. Uh, as the name says, InStoried, Inside Stories, we basically help you create stories across multiple formats. Um, of course, using AI, starting from text to image to video, um, at the click of a few buttons, you can create content, you can create your own images, you can create your own videos, uh, whatever that you might need. Um, and to answer your question about what are uh, you know, some of the best things happening in this space, uh, well, of course, everyone knows about ChatGPT, thanks to Microsoft backing OpenAI. Uh, but yes, uh, ChatGPT became famous last year in October, but we started building a ChatGPT-like product back in 2018. Um, of course, we didn't have the funds to you know, use 1.5 billion data points, but we used 70 million data points and built something exactly similar. 
Um, and, um, you know, as a startup founders have this thing initially that, okay, uh, we've built something phenomenal, why should we sell? We had acquisition offers from Grammarly and, you know, some other folks, but we said, no, we won't sell, we're gonna go and compete against a chat GPT, but then, um, of course, so that uh, that is something out of question right now. But we are we are also uh, you know figuring out how we can partner with ChatGPT because we are focused on marketing, right, and uh, across multiple formats. Yeah. So hi, I'm uh, Ram Prakash Ramamurthy. I'm the director of AI research at Manage Engine, a division of Zoho Corp. So at Manage Engine, we build tools for IT, uh, and uh, we have infused all of these tools with at least one AI feature across our 100 plus products that we offer right now. So the products vary from uh, IT service management to security to endpoint management to monitoring. So coming to the second part of the question, what is the more impactful area that we see with deep tech enabling in our line of work? I think the whole notion of web security has been uh, beefed up by AI. On one side, there are AI scripts to generate malware. On the other side, there are better and power-packed AI tools to, you know, identify these malware, to quarantine these ransomware predominantly. Uh, I think that's one of the interesting problems we solved in Manage Engine because these neural network models have to be run at the endpoint and identify ransomware and malware. So the whole notion of static security thresholds is gone. Everything is going to be dynamic. And that is what AI has enabled for IT. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Um, I'm Mani from Uber, um, taking care of engineering at Bangalore. So uh, one of the differentiating things that we have is uh, on the deep tech space is real-time marketplace, right? Marketplace as a concept has been existing for a long period of time in e-commerce where you put merchants coming, you know, giving you a catalog and then you have sellers. But doing it real-time is an extremely, extremely interesting and a challenging space. Right? When people open the app and when you click a button and when a car comes in front of you, it's a magic. We call it as Uber magic. Earlier, if a car comes after two minutes, people are okay because they are very fancy with the magic. Today, people cannot even wait for 30 seconds. I need the car immediately. I need the auto immediately. Right? How do we do it with real time when you are trying to have two people anywhere in the world meet in the middle of the road, agree on a transaction and then travel? Right? When you want to do that at Uber's scale, where we are operating at 10,000 cities and 100 countries, where you have you know, 5 million earner partners in our platform, how do we figure that out? What kind of things that we do on AI? What kind of things that you do on ML? When you just go and say, hey, here is the destination, I want to go from here to RGA Tech Park, you see a list of offerings to say, at this point in time, how many driver partners in cars are there, in autos are there, in Uber Excel are there, what should be the price? Should I, apply a, should I apply a search? Should I not apply a search? And then show a product offering of 20 listings within two seconds. So that the rider can make a decision is a very interesting problem, right? And how, whether we use ML, whether we use AI, it's all behind the scenes, right? It's all isolated from the riders, right? But for us to do that, deep tech is extremely, extremely important, right? And if you do that once, and if you have the differentiating software, we can apply that in multiple space. During pandemic, when we were super high on rights business, and we said, hey, why don't we leverage the same marketplace and see whether we can go big on the each business, on the delivery business. At that time, Uber was operating close to $50 billion gross bookings on rights. And we were able to get each and rights close to $55 billion globally with a single platform, where you have a single platform today as a real-time marketplace, which boosts both each as well as rights. The moment you have a single platform which can boost eats and rights, there are very few companies in the world which are actually big on rights as well as on eats. You can say, hey, here is a company which is big on rights. In India, you can know which is the company which does rights. In, in some other country, you can know some companies which are good on eats. But there are very few companies which do rights and eats together. And if you have that kind of a differentiating marketplace, you can also introduce new scenarios as an earner partner whose whole goal is to see how I can maximize my earning. You can do rights in the morning, you can do delivery in the afternoon, you can do rights in the evening, you can do delivery in the night, and then you keep switching between the marketplaces so that you can give the best experience for both riders and the earners. And how do we use that using this deep tech is the Uber magic. That's it. Great. Uh, so we cannot have any conversation today without talking about chat GPT. In fact, many of you mentioned it, so I have to ask this question. So um, do you think we are rushing in somewhere? Um, 
I would like to ask this to Mr. Shashank. What's your question? We are rushing in with what? Uh, yeah. The usage of chat, GPT, etc. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we are rushing in because uh, the capabilities of chat, GPT are mesmerizing to say the least, right? But from my side, at least I would say there are a huge amount of privacy concerns when we use chat, GPT, like uh, as a company like SAP, we have so much of customer data, so much of privacy concerns that nobody is willing to share or tell that you can just freely use this data and put on chat GPT or Azure servers and get the responses. So there's a very strict guidelines even within the company, what you can do with chat GPT, what you cannot do with chat GPT. But that does not mean that it's not a good technology. It's definitely a good technology. And what we need to do is to probably look into the open source and see like how this shapes up in open source and provide some models which can be deployed in the company's private data centers. So which will be a win-win for the customers as well as for the corporates. All right. And uh, today the lines between tech and deep tech is blurring. Uh, many startups today are able to find the right product market fit. Uh, even though, uh, even then, uh, we don't find uh, many Series B funding rounds happening. There is not much of M&A. Uh, IPO is still a far cry. So do you uh, see that changing in the medium to long term? Uh, Sharmin, if you can take that question. So um, are you talking about the deep tech sector, IPOs and everything, right? So yes, of course, it is a little blurry, uh, but then, you know, um, of course, when there are large companies like Microsoft, Google, etc., backing, um, you know, medium-sized companies like OpenAI, Anthropic, etc., correct? So then what happens is that, you know, deep tech gets the visibility, right, which, which it wasn't getting earlier. Now, the biggest challenge with any deep tech company, while, let's say, if it has to plan for a SPAC or an IPO in the U.S., whatever, uh, the biggest challenge is the whole... IP based criteria, right? Because any SaaS company is not going to be, um, you know, EBITDA positive anytime soon, right? 90% of SaaS companies are bound to fail. They need to raise a lot of funding in order to sustain, right? So that, that again is a very big challenge that, you know, support from stakeholders, understanding globally, and then, you know, the IP related issues, intellectual property is, is not just about, uh, you know, your copyrights or your trade secrets, but then you've probably taken like three years, you know, like, for example, we did three years, you know, to build your own data sets, right? Um, deep tech is no magic at the end of the day. As they say deep tech, that's because there's a lot of data which is actually being infused into the system. Now, that IP needs to have a value. So until and unless people don't start valuing the intellectual property more than just the, um, you know, your, your numbers on the table, I don't think it's going to be that easy for any deep tech company to, you know, go IPO or SPAC that soon, yeah. Vyom, no, would you like to take this question as well? Uh, so as said by my fellow panel, I just want to reiterate that, uh, again, any deep, com deep tech company at heart uh, requires a lot of funding. Even Chat GPT uh, got funded by consortium of investors, May Google, uh, Microsoft, etc. Google is not part of it, Microsoft is a part of it. Uh, but at the end, we saw in COVID era that there were astronomical valuations. And right now, uh, the investors are more cautious towards profitability, uh, uh, unit economics, and operational profitability at least. So, so that's why we are getting some blurry picture out there when we are saying that the investments are going less in uh, deep tech companies, specifically in Series B and further. When you're saying about MNA, again, the macroeconomic challenges are certainly not favorable. We are having Feds increasing the rates, and uh, like the companies as well as the investors are parking their funds in uh, rather risk-free or uh, less uh, risk uh, financial or investment instruments. So again, that is uh, the second thing. And when we say about IPO, like we all know what has happened recently in India, the tech companies IPO, uh, like they were uh, bleeding to be very honest and to be very harsh as of now. And uh, we didn't see any retail investors get, uh, getting money out of it. So uh, as of now, I say that deep tech 
needs to be in the metamorphosis uh, space and it needs to grow and uh, the, the evolution needs to be there so that the, even the retail investors understand deep, deep tech what it is and what it is exactly. So that is my take. Okay, got it and uh, as uh, Sharmin just mentioned, uh, the inherent advantage of deep tech is IP creation. So do you think that should be valued uh, beyond your immediate revenue uh, if Mr. Sunil can take that up? See, IP uh, creation is part of the journey itself. So if we talk about uh, deep tech, so essentially uh, uh, if you talk about deep tech, uh, it requires a lot of investment, very true. But end of the day, it should solve some problem on the ground which should directly result into making profits for the business. That else, we, if we see around us, there are a lot of deep tech things happening in the academic world. But in order to make it a professional success, uh, it has to make profits for the business. And yes, unless and until IP uh, milestone is crossed, it won't be able to give those benefits uh, for the business. And yes, as I mentioned, so IP creation will be part of the journey and we'll see a lot of those IPs being created in times to come. And what has happened, the actual uh, time span, elapsed time in terms of uh, any tech uh, being getting matured and commercialized and giving fruitful result, that elapsed time has reduced significantly in last few years. So what we are talking about is say maybe a couple of years down the line at the max. Uh, Mr. Sumit, you would like to take that question on IP creation? Uh, I think IP creation and profitability go hand in hand. If you, if you very well define what sector are you focusing on and what's the difference it makes to the end consumer or the user experience or the problem that it solves, then certainly it will, uh, it will attract a lot of uh, not only investor attention but a lot of customers and that's what basically the business is there for. So while our, our focus has to be on, on the user experience, on solving the problem using deep tech, uh, but at the same time uh, if it is only for academics purpose, certainly in the business world it's not going to make that kind of an impact and relevance and hence we and hence we'll see a lot of brilliant ideas not seeing the light of the day because of this so uh, ip creation is important but i think the overall vision in terms of how it makes solves a problem how it makes a difference to the user profitably and takes care of all the stakeholders not just the shareholders but the community the employees uh, you know uh, the investors everyone that is super important Got it. And my last question is to uh, Ram and Manikantan. Uh, where are we going to see the next leg of disruption in uh, tech? Okay. See, <clears throat> two things. See, especially on the transportation space, uh, where we are in, it's always a supply game. Whoever has the maximum supply wins the game, right? So demand is always there, right? So uh, what the approach that we are looking for is two, three, four. One is making us an open platform, right? Today we have IC drivers or earner partners who are registering at Uber and then starting to be an you know, earner partner in Uber. We are also building a lot of stuff around fleets where if, you know, if somebody can have like 50 cars or 200 cars or 10 cars and if they want to run for Uber, how can we make the fleet integration so easily so that they can increase the thing? And then we are also you know, working on 3P taxis. We have a goal that all taxis in Uber by 2025. So we have opened up APIs and we are integrating with a lot of taxis. So the taxi driver will still use the taxi app but Uber demand will come to the taxes. That's one side of the things, right? The second part, uh, you know, is around EVs, right? So there's a whole spectrum of things when it comes to EVs, right? Uh, we may still, it may look very simple that, hey, you know, instead of just a, you know, petrol vehicle, I'm just replacing the EV vehicle. Just in our matching algorithm, I cannot match an EV vehicle where the ride is going to be a 30 kilometer, where the EV charges is going to sustain only for 20 kilometers. Just as one example, right? I'm just taking, you know, EV charge as one example. Like that, there are like, you know, tens of parameters for which we need to take care and figure out how autonomous vehicles and EVs can be partnered on this whole, you know, ride sharing platform is another thing. The last one is autonomous, right? You'd have seen a lot of news around autonomous. We still feel that, you know, it's a good bet. A lot of things are happening. It will take time for us to mature, right? And uh, 
Uber will play an important role on the autonomous stuff. We have already partnered and we have, you know, some of the, you know, delivery things are happening uh, through autonomous vehicles and other stuff. So last one, you know, just since chat GPT is such a, you know, hot topic, I'll just give one line about my thing, right? See, a few years back, when software companies were developing softwares, just building a large-scale distributed system, software itself was a differentiator. There were very few companies which were able to handle petabytes of data, which were able to do millions and millions of compute with their data, uh, you know, uh, data centers. When all these cloud platforms like AWS or GCP or Oracle cloud platforms came in, it's people felt that, oh, my differentiator is gone. A right? lot of companies felt that their differentiator is gone. But then we went through a wave where a lot of us were integrating. That became a commodity. That's no more a differentiator. It became a commodity. If I want to have, you know, store millions of data, I can just integrate with AWS and store it. Right? Today, that is not a differentiator. That became a commodity. When it comes to AI and ML, a lot of companies were using that as a differentiator. Right? And it was very few companies which had that kind of a talent, and it's not easy to build. With the introduction of chat, GPT, and other software, I, I do think a lot more things will come like this. Like, when we started with AWS, it was just AWS, right? And then GCP came in, and then Oracle came in. I'm sure there'll be, you know, few more, you know, big software players who will come in on this space, right? This will now become a commodity. Building an AI-enabled app will become so easy, right? Then what will be the differentiator is what the companies should start to think, because this is no more a differentiator. It became a commodity. It's easy for people to integrate. It's easy to get AI-enabled solutions. So the offerings will be much simpler. Offerings will be much faster. So then what is the differentiator for the company so that others cannot replicate? So that changes the game, right? So all these waves will come in. Who can latches that and then make use of that commodity and then bring in a differentiator for the company will be the winner, right? That's my, my own perspective of how things will evolve on the technology side. Perfect. So uh, Mani was talking about distributed systems and AI as a differentiator. So the way I see this tech evolving, I think privacy is going to come in on a big scale. Our laws have not evolved. I mean, not just in India, but across the globe. There are the, the, the whole GDPR document does not even me mention the word artificial intelligence or machine learning. Right? So, and there are uh, bills that are passed across different states that are in different stages, but there is no concrete laws that can tie AI and privacy. So for example, uh, we always used to see, you have sensitive enterprise information and then you use a translation tool that is built for the consumer or you use a grammar error corrector reductor that was built for the consumer. So look at all kinds of sensitive information that is leaving your system, right? And especially in developing nations like India, where privacy has still I mean, people are not very privacy aware, right? So we don't pay for our search engines, we don't pay for our social networks. We, uh, so now Apple is doing a good job by, you know, by calling privacy as a differentiator. So I see this trend where privacy enabled technologies will evolve and people like, I mean, the cliched saying goes data is the new oil, but it, it is just a statement. How many of us are actually giving up our personal data for some services that we use? So. There is, I see an increase in very strict and tightening of privacy norms across apps and privacy is going to be the next differentiator at least for the next decade. And hope privacy becomes a commodity and that is the best we could aim for. Thank you.